De vuelta después del almuerzo en So we're Argentina. back after lunch in Argentina at least. Probably a bit of an early lunch in the rest of the region and perhaps it's mid-afternoon tea time in other parts of the world. So I'm delighted to present you a great friend of the South School on Internet Governance. It's Diego. Diego is from Mendoza, my home ground. I actually met him in Washington the first time that we organized the school hosted by the OAS in Washington. We've both studied at the same university at different times because he is younger than I am. But we met thanks to the school in another part of the world. So we stayed in touch over time. He's been to Buenos Aires um, for many of the Agen Sikh sessions, the Argentine School on Internet Governance. He's been with us in person and virtually. He and his partner, uh, Marcelo, they've taken part in lots of activities uh, hosted at the University of Mendoza, my alma mater. Diego, in addition to being a, a, a great colleague, he's a he's an entrepreneur. He works in lots of different companies and has developed a very interesting experience in terms of the financial and technological aspects. It's fintech, right? Diego, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. I hope you're all well in Mendoza. Here, we're um, staying at home, but we're doing all right. In this virtual edition of the South School on Internet Governance, we have lots of participants and students from all over Latin America, and indeed, people from even further afield. So, welcome. And, um, well, tell us what you're going to be talking about, because you'll probably explain it better than I will. Hi, Diego. Hi, Olga. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for always <laughs> bringing Mendoza to mind. Welcome, everybody. The um, idea behind my presentation today is so that we can talk about... I, I always refer to the experience I had at the school, not so I, I, I want to comment on a certain... Uh, I, I want to tell you what fintech is about, and then I want to tell you a little bit about the Argentine ecosystem. And one of the things that we're seeing that's happening in the region about the technologies and the advances in this area, which is where I work. That's the introduction at any rate. Now, if um, sh sh shall I just get on with it then? Yes, yes, absolutely. Can you share your screen with us? Great. Right. Well, as I was saying, we're going to be talking about fintech and the Argentine ecosystem. I am... Um, I would just like to take the university professor's approach. FinTech, where's it from? It actually is a, a blend of finance and technology. It was first used. We, we, well, we think it's like the, the digital bankerization of people, but in fact, it goes all the way back to an American banker back in the early 1970s he was called Leon Bettinger, and he was writing about how important it was to see the first computers being used in the financial world. And he added that there was there, this would lead to great changes in the industry because it was possible to do so many tasks, particularly financial analysis tasks, uh, in an automated way. So he said that finance and technology had led to a new setup in the financial world, and that's where the name came from. Now, if we look at how we use it today, we're talking about those companies who make the most of technology to create better and maybe new financial services for consumers and companies. That's probably, um, that's a that's a Morningstar's definition. Now, if we had to ask ourselves, why are we talking about fintech? 
we see that the objectives being proposed in this branch of industry and technology, it's to cut costs, the cost of services and transactions, or perhaps reach new market segments that haven't been uh, exploited before, maybe they're too expensive. The possibility of achieving economies of scale, and particularly the idea of improving customer experience. I, we could talk about other objectives, but I think that these basically summarize what we're saying today in each of our countries. As we see new services developing, and in general, the idea is to make these services easier to use, more convenient, or faster. It's like things that perhaps we weren't able to do before, we can now do them. There are tons of situations you know, um, foreign currencies, the ability to carry out transactions, trans money transfers, uh, particularly in our region in Latin America. And in general, that means that it is becoming easier. That's the first sensation that you have about fintech and how it improves customers' experiences. Now, let's look at the universe of fintech because we say fintech and we, we talk about lot when we're talking about lots of things. And at global level, we decided to, to divide it into domains, which allow us to classify it in the following way. This is more interesting perhaps when it comes to tackling how we compare or understand or try to understand how they, they're different, how they're used. So the first big group of fintech companies are those that raise capital, capital raising companies. That means to say that they raise capital, doesn't it? To invest. In the fintech world, one of the most interesting models, which has been pursued at the moment, and it wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for technology, is crowdfunding. And the idea behind crowdfunding is situations such as those that we find in certain apps when a number of different people who actually have nothing to do with each other, but they all decide to invest in one single project. Like a startup, Kickstarter, for instance, is a platform which is a crowdfunding platform when somebody has a good idea, good product, and they want to attract investment to scale it up. And this can only happen if a certain number of people decide they're going to put money into it. The platform also works as a marketplace where people can actually consume the product. So I say Kickstarter is one of those. There are other fintech models which have to do with financing mechanisms, alternative financing mechanisms, such as um, all those situations which allow me to get capital from a series of sources that are not banks, could be other people or other entrepreneurs. Then there's the area of deposits and loans. Companies which handle personal finance, like new banks for digital natives, or alternative financing situa situations like peer-to-peer -peer loans. For instance, I have my money and I want to be in charge of administrating my finances. And we have digital banks in Argentina. We have three, maybe there are probably other ones in Latin America too. And there are other banking experience which are totally digital. This has been happening for the last couple of years. These are banks which basically don't actually have physical branches but everything that they do 
in terms of customer work is carried out digitally. We'll see this further ahead in this presentation when we see how we work with customers who weren't customers from a traditional bank can be onboarded and how to work with them. Finance other alternating, alternative financing platforms, peer-to-peer -peer lending. We've had the, we have these in Argentina. These are platforms which have enabled these, such as Affluenta, which allows people to decide to invest, get make a profit, and then that allows them to lend money to somebody who wants to carry out a project. So basically, these are loans, deposit and loans, savings and loans companies. And then we have those who create finance software, which are obviously key to this market. These are companies who are building tools for workflow management. It's, it's about process flows, really, whereby, because all financial operations need flows to ensure that somebody acquires or uses a new product, accountancy, invoicing, business intelligence, tools, analytics, all that side of things. And we're talking about companies who provide those signs of solutions to other companies who uh, develop these into their services. Then we're looking at investment management in the private or institutional sector. This basically means all those companies which allow, beyond my personal finance administration, when I decide what I want to invest in, and if I invest in an investment fund or, or I buy shares, this is more, more geared towards those companies who provide intelligence to help people decide where they're going to invest. And there's an index which, for instance, helps me to... Uh, 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 to to profile my investment and their algorithms which help me take decisions. These have been around for a few years, but um, this all comes under the umbrella of investment management. And then we have institutional investment management, management uh, um, uh, technology, which helps funds to, well, helps to uh, uh, investment fund management as a whole. And we're looking at the advent of blockchain in this sense. This is a technology which is very much open to the possibility of quite, quite complex models, which allows them to issue blockchain technology. could be a, a limited issue of a virtual currency, and this currency could be leveled with a bond, and maybe it might be sovereign bonds, or it could be um, shares, like Banco Santander in Spain, for instance, has um, permitted op transactions like this, when uh, there was a, a bond issue, there was a sovereign bond issue, or it was a regional issue, and that was backed by the acquisition of a cryptocurrency, which allowed people to buy that bond. Fifth category talks about market financing. This is uh, a very clear development. In fact, one of my companies, which we're working on, is a marketplace. All the adders, where, where we, what we do is we bring together different players within a market. We might have, for instance, in the case that I was talking about, Comar, it provides credits. It's a marketplace. It's a place where companies who want to make loans, they can place their offer, and those who need a loan can go there. And so there's a, there's a relationship created between those market players. That's a marketplace. Then they are what we know as aggregators, where what I do is... It's like a more regulated sort of marketplace, in fact, where people can decide, um, make decisions. Uh, a client makes a decision, and I can give it as a solution to another supplier. It's a little bit more like 
um, the tri Trivago model, you know, there's lots and lots of solutions available and and you can choose from the one that you like best. And then, of course, there are like financial social networks. And finally, the last segment, the last domain is, is pay domain. That's what we really think of when we talk about fintech. We think of fintech as the universe of payments. This is why I left it to the end. And it has to do with all the back end. It's the infrastructure. All our countries are quite different when it comes to payment infrastructures. It's not a simple universe by any means. If you think, for instance, about what's involved in making a payment, we're talking about everything from producing the, the, the credit card, you put it through the postnet, this has to be linked to a terminal, which reads it, uploads it to the network, the transaction is completed, it has to interact with my bank, with my account. And all of that infrastructure is what we call back-end, because we don't see it. But we can say that we have players who are always behind the scenes and uh, with these payment networks like Postnet. And then the credit card issuers, which process the payment data, they're not necessarily the owners of the networks per se. And what we see are our e-wallets which means that my physical card actually is transformed into a wallet and the transaction occurs in purely digital format. And this is the universe which, if you like, is a sixth domain of what fintechs are and do. Now, the idea here is to be able to look at a company and say, this is a company from such and such a sector, because you know in which of these domains it fits. It's very diverse. And what's happening more and more, to give you an example of a company which makes us very proud, proud here, Mercado Libre, it's an Argentine company. It doesn't fit into only one of these domains because it's done so much in so many different areas. And it's done a great deal to narrow the, digi the financial digital gap. Now, if I look at my Mercado Pargo uh, application. It means I can make a payment with my debit card or my credit card, but I can also receive funds into my e-wallet, or maybe I can decide to take out a loan and it analyzes my behavior on this digital Mercado Pago application. So there are lots of services which I can use uh, within this, this these applications. I've put some of the technologies up here. Now, if we were to say which are the technologies that fintechs are using to provide these new financial services, you can see here that um, we're talking about technologies because sometimes we look at the technology and we think it's actually a subject area. Now, obviously, the, the first technology, which is really revolutionizing the marketplace, and you see it a lot in the back end. We don't actually see it so much in daily life. It's what we call blockchain. You've, it's probably come up in other talks, but we believe that this technology is the way forward. It allows us to have greater balance of accounts distributed throughout the world. It means that we can reach agreement in that what we have uh, what we have in our balance and our transactions is the same as elsewhere. It's a kind of technology which provides a range of services which are impossible beforehand. Now, if we took a more paradigmatic uh, example, the most the most successful implementation of blockchain is Bitcoin. It's a cryptocurrency, which allows us to exchange value using this currency. And the, the, the technology behind that is blockchain. But we can also use blockchain 
for example, to carry out international transactions, interbanking transactions, and replace the current systems. There's lots of initiatives in this area where you move money from one international bank to another. Because what lies behind that requires the ability to be able to manage the balance of transactions. We also have blockchain being used to carry out, to keep the register of loans granted. It's a technology which is behind so many services and which we don't see, but it's there. Obviously, one of the key things today, which allows us to create all these services that we wouldn't have been able to do before, such as the ability to evaluate and create new products based on the behavior of huge amount numbers of consumers and take and the different actions taken by these consumers. Well, we're talking about AI and deep learning. Now, if we could, if I were to talk about the industry I work in, where we make loans, we would say that AI and deep learning has enabled us to use the information we've acquired on how people behave on the basis of learning algorithms, which learn from people's past behavior. All of this enables us to anticipate whether we have the same information about future clients and how they'll behave, which allows us to create coring models or how we provide people with the best product according to their behavior and not just what the Bureau of Information says or their profile or their salary it goes much deeper. So that is highly inserted into the world of loans we use similar technology today that um, Mercado Créditos, which is part of Mercado Libre, it's loans. It means that they can give somebody a loan if they don't have any financial records, even though they might have had some sort of activity selling on Mercado Libre platform. So natural language processing technologies have changed the level of attention paid by all companies, because today we have the possibility that a chatbot, a bot, we're in fact talking to somebody that who we're writing to, it feels like we're talking to somebody using natural language, it might even be grammatical where, uh, errors, but the bot can understand the question and extrapolate the meaning and answer us without the intervention of a human. The use of natural language processing techniques and deep learning about talks with the discussions with clients allows us to synthesize and create incredibly efficient um, client services bots online. Cloud computing technology probably not much to be explained there, but today cloud computing is the layer upon which we work. Many companies that are being born today don't actually have a physical infrastructure as such. They just work uh, on an area on the cloud, which they've acquired, and they just set up in the cloud. Customer relationship management automation tools. It's like you have an automatic advisor which is loaded into it as part of the CRM, and then maybe an operator uh, creates a product on the basis of that. And that's the basis today for pretty much any company providing financial services. I talked about bots earlier, but uh, here we go again. And and, and then there's the whole business about um, the last point, how we use biometric data technologies that take physical characteristics 
and uh, help them to use them to identify clients. This means that we can provide non presential because the idea of having having a, a, a digital company or providing financial services which doesn't have an actual branch physical branch it means that they can identify their clients we're going to talk about argentina specifically in a bit now Now, in this first part, where we were looking at the conceptual aspects of my talk, if we were to see what the situation is in Argentina today, this information is referenced. You can find it anywhere. It's a document produced by the FinTech Chamber in our country. We actually have an association of fintech companies, which involves all the companies that are operational in any of these domains that we mentioned. And it, they've drawn up a strategy of a financial inclusion, which is a highly interesting program. And the, the document has got loads of interesting references in it. A few years ago, we thought that the main problem was that most people did not have a bank account. And 80% of the adults in this country today ha do have a bank account. It's not ideal, but it's a pretty high percentage, pretty high number of people who have access to a bank account. Now, if we compare this with other countries in the region, this shows us that uh, it's not the same everywhere. But if we compare Argentina with other countries, the number of bank accounts for every per 10,000 adults is equivalent to countries such as Spain, which is pretty much the same, less than Chile, right? But it's um, when we talk about accounts, we're talking about savings accounts. There are lots of people who, in order to get some form of state allowances, need to have a bank account, okay? So there may, is a reason behind this. This is a chart that shows us the situation of Argentina in, in compared to the rest of the region. In terms of the percentage or the proportion of credits, it's always been low with regard to uh, compared with deposits. Now, but in the in and as a whole in the region, it's it's not doing well. The blue, the deep blue line are credits and loans, and the pale blue line are deposits. So, in terms of the solidity of the financial system, it's it's loaning less than what is deposited. But if we compare it with other countries, serious ones, we might like to say like Germany, credit, and this is something that we all know about, isn't it? Credit is a real problem in Argentina, access to credit. If we look at the financial system, Argentina's financial system is generally solid. It's sound. It's mostly private, in private hands. In terms of the number of financial entities, we have 63 banks, of which 50 are private and 13 public. This has changed a great deal over the last 20 years. There used to be far, many more, far more public banks. And we have entities that are financial entities, which aren't exactly banks. In Argentina, the regulation reaches those companies that handle financial intermediation. That's to say that they take the deposits from their clients and use those to place them in funds to invest. And that's quite an interesting definition given by the BCRA, the central bank, is that any entity which is not doing credit form of intermediation is not subject to regulation, financial regulation carried out by the central bank. So if they're not taking deposits and using those, 
because the financial system protects people's deposits. Now, down here on the right, it's quite interesting to see that we have 70, 68 financial entities, but in fact, we have nearly 124 credit card issuers and purchase card issuers. There are loads and loads of regional cards in Argentina, which only work in the interior of the country. And some of those have been purchased by larger cards, for instance, here, we have one that we was called Nevada, and then it was bought by the Galicia Bank, and then they fused it with their uh, with their card. And what we have today is the end product, which is called the orange card, naranja. Then there are 238 other credit financial because they're not actually financial because they're not regulated, but they provide credit. They offer credit. They offer loans with their own funds, not private funds necessarily. So this is quite interesting in terms of how our fintech ecosystem works in Argentina. The difference, the colors is the clear ones, is the beginning of the year. It allows us to see growth. It's divided between the different domains that we saw earlier. So we can say that there has been growth the last five years across the board in fact nearly all in all areas there's been a the, the number of companies has doubled we've got lots of payment companies finance management companies and we've also got some argentine companies who work on financial infrastructure The greatest proportion of these are loan savings and loans companies, followed by payments and remittances. That includes the, the number of companies, okay? We're not talking about the volume of transactions per se, because if we were to look at that, then I think probably, I think the remittances will come be first. So 26% are remittances, companies that would do cryptocurrencies, financial management, asset management, and Insurtech, which is all the part that has to do with insurance. We have traders, and we have companies, and, and this is something that will probably, uh, well, we're looking at a new Argentine unicorn, Unisys, which provides systems for digital systems for financial companies. My last point before I wrap up is that the objectives the objectives set by our plan in terms of the national financial plan or program is to create better and greater access to accounts and electronic payment means to more people. The objective has shown great improvement over the last few years. But it's probably covered in this sense, not so much in the second area, but what I think we're going to be seeing, particularly during the pandemic, is how these, um, these tools are being used more and more frequently and thanks to the fact that we've had the capacity to find payment solutions, digital solutions, there's been more movement in the economy on the basis of these new payment means. Perhaps we're not doing so well in the area of improving people's general digital capabilities and user protection. This means that the access to equal possibilities of accessing loans, insurance, is still not good. We can, I, I don't have the exact figures, but, but one of the aspects they're looking at is to improve gender equality in the area of finance. Now, 
to finalize, I want to show you the overall view of the fintech landscape in Argentina. This is Finnovating. If you look on internet, it shows you the landscape of fintech landscape of every country in, La in Latin America. I've highlighted a few here. These two companies, which deal with .gov uh, or credits, and this is these are the ones that our company coordinates. But we also have up here these ones up here, payments, financial products, the yellow real tech, accounting, investing, investments, insurance, financial infrastructure, loans, currencies, and personal finance. In each category, we have Argentine companies. We have great Argentine companies within, and lots of Argentine unicorns, as I was saying. We can see Technicis over here in the payments part. We have Mercado Pago, obviously. I, I, but um, and and we have Out Zero, which is another Argentine unicorn, which provides back end for validation and all those kinds of services which are user authentication. And moving on. The, the last minute of my speech, I would like to talk about, am I okay? Yes, I have, do I have time? Yes. I would like to tell you about what's happening at the moment, what people are really looking for, most popular thing, what's trending, what makes a difference in between what, what, what we need to Bring, take infrastructure to another level. We're talking about onboarding. How do we get new clients and ensure that they can access our products and services quickly and easily? We're not used, this word isn't just used in the financial world. I can talk about onboarding and with human resources. So how can I get our new recruits to, to integrate properly into the company? Uh, maybe I do online sessions, workshops, whatever. But on financial onboarding is additionally complex because it's linked to regulatory aspects governing the industry. We say onboarding is the beginning of a consensual relationship, a direct one between an entity and its customer. And that's a crucial moment because it means that the client is coming to get a particular service. And, and if we say that prospect isn't going to be a good client, then we can offer them the opportunity to transform into a client and get another kind of service. What a company needs is the onboarding. It's a tool enabling them to turn that prospect into a client. Normally, we've done this on site. This means that most of us probably opened our bank accounts by going to a bank branch and completing a series of forms and requirements. And the point is that I actually had to go there in person in order to become a client. Now, what we've seen in fact, most of what's working today is a kind of hybrid situation. It's semi-on-site where many players are beginning to use digital documentation. Like, for instance, you can get it through some sort of email. And it's, it's completed by somebody going to the bank and signing it, or somebody brings it to my house and I sign it. And that's kind of a hybrid onboarding. And then there's digital onboarding, where somebody can carry out the entire process in digital format so that the user doesn't have to leave home. They don't have to go to the branch or a, a center. This requires certain guarantees. For example, and as a recommendation, a credit onboarding 
as a recommendation from the Central Bank Ideas Forum, and we probably heard about this, you, there is a record, and you have to have an, a valid, an identity validation, and this identity check is carried out using some sort of bureau, which is a company which specializes in providing information about people, whether legal uh, companies or people. This identity validation can be carried out on the phone or like, or, or like, for instance, when you want to pay with something on a credit card and they ask you questions and you have to know the answers. This allows you to check that whoever's using the credit card is actually who they say they are. This is a key process. Not so much for this, but identity validation and authentication is required by law in order to access digital contracts or agreements. Credit flows usually have to be validated. There has to be a risk evaluation. There has to be a, a request in terms of what I want from the loan. They have to be confirmation. And, and then, you know, once the loan is up and running, you have to make sure that the payments are, are properly made. And this is what you call, you know, the, 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 the steps, the, the flow of the process. This is the last one. In this aspect, our country is quite well organized. There's a good state policy which has been upheld over the last 10 years. Onboarding at global level, regulatory and compliance policies require KYC, know your client. Any financial entity is obliged to show that they know who their clients are. And they know this because they've checked, they've authenticated their identity. And the rules require a certain number of documents to be provided that can prove this. And then others, other lots of countries have uh, anti-money laundering practices. And you have to be able to prove that this new client is not involved in money laundering or the illegal use of money in any way or money that could come from terrorism financing. And I'm because I would be obliged to report that. Lastly, our country has an organ dedicated to the National Persons Registry, which is responsible for issuing the certificate. It's known as the RENAPER, the National Register of Persons. And through a series of decrees and uh, legal modifications regarding the identification of people, is today the body organized, the organized body, um, the authorized body to, to verify people's entities in Argentina. This organism has built an infrastructure at a technological level, which allows it to affirm that a person is who they say they are using a series of legally validated processes. This means that they can testify as to the validity of a person's identity when they do certain processes. For instance, if I can show legally and validate that the person who is on the other end of a mobile device or, or a computer terminal, if I can show that, that they are who they say they are, then, then I can also validate commercial contracts or services which are within uh, the legal frameworks and thus acquire a new client without requiring them to be physically present. What many of us have seen, or many have noticed, and particularly in Argentina, this tends to happen if, if you open an account in a digital bank, 
or if you take out one of these digital cards like the naranja, the orange cards, you are required to, to, uh, to complete a number of steps. But in Argentina, we, we can now download our documents to our phones once we've done take had a picture taken of our document and this validates that we are who we say we are and that's the point of this service lastly can, can you hear we have another panel now i'm sorry to interrupt you and i have some really interesting questions but i commit to sending them to you if you can send me your answers I'm sorry, but we, we do have a very tight agenda today. And it's so interesting and I admire. You look like a financier, but actually I know you're an electronics engineer. So I really have to say that I admire the way you've adapted to, um, to all these uh, new things, given your professional background. You know, you're really into all this finance stuff, this fintech stuff, which you described so well. And I've heard that you are running a, a bunch of really, really successful enterprises. I have my other panelists waiting for me in Mexico. The questions have been really interesting, so I commit to sending to you in the break. Um, please don't get... <laughs> you have to bear with me, okay? We, we must respect the timing. Okay, thank you very much. So hugs to your family. I hope that everybody is well over there. Stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you soon in the not-too-distant future. Bye. And greetings from Adriana Nogora, who are with me today. Bye-bye. Well, we have one minute, and then we're going with Dean Ornella from Mexico.